Welcome again to the 2017 Spring Crown Bad Lecture. I'm very happy to introduce our speaker today, uh, Dr. Rihanna Avenia Tapper. She's an assistant professor in the TESOL and Applied Linguistics program here at Teachers College. Um, and today she'll be talking about her recent research using the program ALTSTEP. Alt can I say ALTSTEP or is it ALTSTEP? Um, and uh, just to give you a little bit of background on who Dr. Avenia Tapper is, um, she, her research mainly focuses on grammatical choices involved in academic achievement and especially how the choices are related to power um, in and out of school. So she looks at student discourse, classroom discourse, and also parent and student discourse. Um, and specifically today's talk will be uh, about the Altstep program and her research with that. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Rihanna Abnina Tucker. Thank you so much. And thanks for coming. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about a quasi-experimental intervention study that I'm currently conducting. And my hope in presenting some ongoing research is that I can convince some of you that uh, this data is interesting and perhaps bring you on board um, as potential collaborators. Um, so the, um, the study is related to this program called ALTSTEP. Um, that's based on a hypothesis about the relationship between expert positioning and academic language. Um, so I'm going to go into that um, and where that hypothesis comes from, but I want to start, again, because I'm hoping to sort of entice you to be interested in this data, I'm going to start with the data. So we're going to look at some things that we've already collected from the pre-assessments, student writing and student talk. Um, and the first part is a little bit uh, interactive, um, so I'm going to ask you to complete the language task that the students completed so that we can get a sense of what you might expect students to produce in response to the same prompt. So uh, you need a computer or a paper and pencil. If you don't have paper and pencil, you can take from here, pass it around. Um, so what I'd like you to do first is write a dictionary definition for the word anger. Does anyone need paper and pencil? How would you define anger? And you included more information to describe the human state. Great. Anybody else? There's no right or wrong answer here, guys. More help? I can. <laughs> Great. Um, I said a strong negative feeling of being displeased or upset with someone or something. Okay. Interesting. So again, uh, an, an overarching category, right? A feeling. Anger is one kind of feeling. And then information that adds to that or extends that, right? Um, okay, so I'm going to show you two examples of student responses to this prompt. So one student wrote, when you are frustrated at something or someone, and one student wrote, a feeling that makes you scream or hit. So when you compare these two responses, um, which one are you more impressed by? Which one do you think, or let's start with that, which one are you more impressed by? A, why? Because it is, in, it describes um, a, also a state of being mm -hmm. where a student B describes a reaction. Okay. Anybody agree or disagree? Is everybody impressed more with A than B? Becky? I'm impressed by 
of me because I like how the student says it's a feeling and identifies what it is. Mm -hmm. Right, there's a, there's a taxonomic relationship, right? They reference taxonomic relationship. So they're defining anger and they refer to the category in which anger fits, right? Um, so uh, I, these are great comments because it really illustrates how when we make judgments about the impressiveness of a student's response, right, we can draw on a lot of different sort of um, value systems to make that judgment. However, um, previous research that's looked at definitions that are most aligned with expectations in school, um, they call them like the most formal definitions, uh, typically um, sort of argue that um, the more formal definitions fit this structure, right? They, they reference a hierarchical relationship and then they add more information, often using a relative clause. Um, and then previous research, um, Catherine Snow has done a lot of work on this, shows that student production of definitions that fit this form is actually associated with academic achievement. Okay. So we're gonna, we're gonna repeat this sequence. Um, just take a few minutes, it doesn't have to be perfect. You don't have to read it out loud. Quickly write a short paragraph explaining all about New York City. Maybe three to four sentences. What would you say about New York City? Yes. What is the background of the students? Are they so they are um, they're linguistically diverse. So they come from a high low income, a high um, very reduced lunch school, and most of them are emergent bilinguals, although not all. Um, and the L1 is Spanish. I'll explain the, the demographics of the classes in the study. And then take a couple seconds to reread what you wrote and notice how you used language. What kinds of grammatical choices are you making in your writing? What kinds of sentences are you using? What kinds of words are you using? What's the larger discourse structure? Do you have a topic sentence with related details? Do you have a sequence of events? How is your paragraph format? Now we're going to look at two responses from students in the program. And again, these are all pre-assessment results, right? So it's not, I'm showing you um, responses that are different, but uh, they're not different because of any kind of treatment. Right? This is all from the beginning of the study. Um, so one student wrote, New York City is a big city. It has tall buildings. New York City has stores. It has supermarkets. It has places where kids can play. In New York City, a lot of things happen. There are a lot of bridges there. And the second student wrote, New York City is one of the most popular cities. It has one of the tallest buildings in the world, the Empire State Building. A lot of people visit the Empire State to see the whole city with its lights. That is why it is called the city that never sleeps. Okay? So which are you more impressed by and why? I, I would say the second one I'm more impressed by because it feels like there is there is structure to it. So it's starting from New York City as a whole, it's one of the biggest city, and then focusing on one aspect of it, and then adding details to it. Okay. Whereas student three's paragraph looked 
it's more like a list. Okay. A list of sentences that's not necessarily coherent. Great. Okay. So there's two different organizing structures, and this is more what we expect from this kind of writing. Right. Topic and then supporting details. Mm -hmm. um, anything else that you notice that's different that you're impressed by in either one? Yeah. I'm just doing a core uses more variety of sentences. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep, different kinds. The student three has a lot of blank, does blank, right? Uh, simple sentences. Anything else? So some ways that we can compare these two responses um, are in terms of didactic terms, um, which broadly are words that are used to refer to other words, right? Things like it, he, she, they, there, now. Words where you uh, need to draw information from the con from the physical and temporal context of the utterance to understand to what it refers, um, which is this is a longer conversation, but that's true for all words to some degree. But for de terms like it, now, here, right, that's particularly true. Um, so we can look at the ratio of deactic terms to total words in the two responses. We can look at tier two words. Tier two word words. Um, in the program that I'm using for analysis are words that um, are not in the 2,000 most common words used in the English language, right? Um, so they're less common words. Um, we can look at the uh, density of longer noun phrases. Um, we can look at relative clauses, and we can look at complex uh, sentence complexity on a sentence variety. Um, so these are some ways that we can compare the two pieces of writing to try to get at which one is perhaps more academic, right? Because academic language is an abstract concept. Um, so we need to think about what can we use as a proxy to measure the academicness of language, right? Um, so you can see these two responses. Um, we, there was sort of, I think, general consensus that this, the second response was more academic, right? Or more aligned with what we expect in school um, or from some value systems more impressive, right? Um, and so we can see that they, that uh, response relies less heavily on deactic terms um, and it has more complex sentences. So those are two ways to kind of measure the difference that we saw in those two pieces of writing. Okay. So we're going to move on to some results um, from the oral language assessment. Uh, students were asked a number of questions and their responses were recorded. Uh, so one question that they answered was, tell me about the life cycle of a caterpillar. So just take a minute and imagine what you would say in response to that question. Okay, now we're gonna listen to one student's response. Um, well first they, first a mother butterfly um, um, lays an egg and then the egg hatches and turns into a larva, and then it usually eats a lot until it gets bigger, and then goes into chrysalis, and then comes out a butterfly for like a couple weeks and then dies. One response, and playing in response. the stages of its life. The stages of the life of a caterpillar. A caterpillar is small and then when a caterpillar grows up, it turns into a butterfly. Very good. And tell me about the life cycle of a duck. Okay. So... Um, 
think about the differences between these two responses, how you might describe the differences, and whether or not you're more impressed by one or the other. Does anybody have a, a clear preference for one or the other? Yeah? Uh, student why? Why? Um, I think it answered the question better uh, and was more specific in the using the terminology like larva and chrysalis and all of that. Okay, so we have some like content specific vocabulary. Yeah? Anything else that you notice is different? Uh, so I uh huh. So more transitions, yeah. Um, but then they both do then, 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 right? But student five has first. Uh, uses a couple weeks. Uh, usually, right? Um, okay. Anything else you notice about the differences between the responses or your preference for one or the other? So with spoken language, it's harder to analyze a sentence complexity and um, noun phrase density because um, you know, it's not so clear necessarily where the speaker wants the sentence to end. Um, so uh, we're using a little bit of a different lens to analyze the academicness of the spoken language. Um, so we still look at didactic terms um, and use the tier two words, and then we looked for information and clarity. Um, Information and clarity ratings using this rubric here. So, little information is communicated, some information, a substantial amount of information is communicated, and clarity, difficult to understand, several clear points that disorganized or not signposted by discourse markers, and then a three would be um, clear, organized, signposted by discourse markers, right? So, in that respect, student five, uh, we can sort of talk about um, uh, measurable linguistic measurable differences in linguistic form between the two that work to construct the more academic nature of the first one um, by looking at information, clarity, and uh, ratio of deck in terms of total words. So why should we care if students are using academic language, right? So maybe I've convinced you that some ways to measure academic language are uh, reliance on deck terms, a uh, number of complex sentences, tier two vocabulary words, um, uh, organization, right? But why do we care? One, we care because theorists argue that um, students' ability to use academic language is a really key piece in their ability to successfully um, engage in the communicative activities that we expect them to participate in in school, right? And uh, the other thing is that um, empirically we have evidence that there's an association between academic language proficiency and academic achievement. Do we already know how to teach students to use academic language? We know a lot about it. In particular, we definitely know um, about how to teach academic vocabulary, right? Um, there's been some studies uh, about like how teachers think about academic language and um, evidence that teachers are very aware of academic vocabulary. Um, and there's intervention studies that have targeted academic vocabulary and gotten good results. However, there's very few studies that have targeted the grammatical choices that students should make to increase the academicness of their writing and speech. Um, so that's kind of the opening into which this study is kind of trying to crawl. Um, and in thinking about how to sort of attack that particular area, um, I've been thinking a lot about the idea of um, expert positioning. Uh, I started thinking about expert positioning as a doc student, actually. Um, communicating with professors because uh, I was noticing a lot of tension in myself when I wanted to state something very clearly um, and yet I wanted to defer to the expertise of the person that I was communicating with, right? I wanted to not position myself as an expert in relation to them. It made it harder to be explicit and clear, right? So I started thinking like, what, what's this connection between academic language um, and then I was also reading a lot of systemic functional linguistics, and um, systemic functional lingu linguists argue that a lot of the grammatical choices that we see in academic language, the grammatical choices that differentiate academic language from more everyday language, are choices that function to construct a position of expertise. They help the speaker present themselves as an expert. 
So, and um, so then thinking about more like how do we teach this, right? This is probably something that you guys are familiar with. If we want students to learn to use a particular piece of language, we have to give them meaningful opportunities to use that language, right? You want them to learn vocabulary related to sports. You want them to have conversations about sports, right? So this is sort of taking that same idea. Um, if we want students to use grammatical, uh, to make grammatical choices that are associated with the construction of an expert position, then we need to put them in positions of expertise. So the, the, the conclusion, positioning students as experts should give them authentic opportunities to practice academic language. So I have this hypothesis. When students are regularly positioned as experts in relation to their audience, they will get more practice making linguistic choices associated with academic language and will then be more likely to make those choices in a range of settings, including assessment. So the idea is if Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, you position the student as an expert in relation to their interlocutor. But on Friday, if you give them really any kind of task, you'll be more, you'll, you'll have raised the possibility that they're gonna make choices that construct a position of expertise, right? So it's gonna extend across time, is the hope. Um, so that's basically um, the story of this instructional treatment, right? I'll step back in language through students taking expert positions. The actual things that are happening in classrooms are very simple, right? It's very straightforward, and it's stuff that practitioners know is useful, right? So, which I actually think is a really um, useful feature of this intervention, right? Because with any intervention, you wanna make sure that it's something that will actually be used. Um, so this takes like 10 minutes to explain to a teacher. It has very little teacher prep involved. Um, it's very straightforward. Uh, so, if, if it's so kind of well known as a practice, why study it? Because we don't know whether or not this practice affects the grammatical choices that students are making, right? We know that teaching younger students about your learning helps you to learn that content. We don't know how it changes your linguistic choices. Um, so, the instructional treatment that's currently being tested um, at an elementary school at the top tip of Manhattan. Um, we're kind of, we have a fourth and a fifth grade class um, that are the treatment classes, two third grade classes that are the control class, which is a problem that we'll talk about. Um, and then the treatment students are regularly um, concluding a unit of study across subject areas by creating a teaching book in one lesson uh, for the first graders, and then in the second lesson, going to the first grade classrooms to share those books and teach the first graders about the topic. Um, this is Rocio, she's been collecting pre-test data and then she's also been uh, working with the teachers to make sure that they're implementing the treatment and then to go and record students as they engage in the treatment. Um, so to introduce you to the treatment, uh, this is um, a cover of a teaching book that one of the fourth graders created. Um, he was teaching the first graders about fractions this said Mr. and then his last name. So you can kind of from this image already see the way that this student is taking on a position of expertise, right? He's the teacher and he knows about fractions. He's got a tie, right? Um, so I think it's a nice visual rep representation of the idea of the study. Okay. So then how are we actually um, studying these grammatical choices? Um, so it's quasi-experimental, right, in that there's a control and a treatment, but students are not randomly assigned. Um, there are two uh, treatment classes and two control classes. The idea is that the two control and two treatment would be upper elementary, right, and they each work with, or the two treatment classes work with lower elementary students. Third, fourth, and fifth grade are all upper elementary, so it kind of works, but there's a problem, right, in the design, um, in that the two control classes are third grade classes, and then the two Treatment classes are fourth and fifth grade. Um, however, uh, as I talked about in the analysis, I think we have a way to address that. Um, also, one of the treatment and one of the control classes each is a, um, an ENL class. So everybody in it has been classified as an ELL who has not yet um, demonstrated full proficiency. Um, okay, so then we're doing the written and oral assessments um, with students in all four of the classes at the beginning and end of the semester. Um, we got consent from about 12 students per class. Um, the written and oral assessments look like what you saw. There are more written questions than there are more speaking questions, but it's the same idea. 
Um, and then when the study was originally designed, we were hoping for eight modules across the semester, so eight bookmaking lessons and eight uh, teaching lessons. Now we're shooting for like four to six, hopefully. Um, and then, uh, I think importantly, we're doing audio recordings of students as they engage in these treatment lessons, right? So that we don't just have like, there was a game, but we have some idea about the process. Um, and you know, if there isn't a game, uh, we can look at the process and perhaps find interesting things. And if there is a game, we can look at the process and see like, what can we see change over time? Can we see small steps that we change over time? Um, so, we have the pre and post oral assessments, uh, and we'll be looking at the active term use, the tier two vocabulary use, information and clarity, as I showed you on the rubric. Uh, for the pre and post written assessments, we'll be looking at active terms, tier two vocabulary, noun phrases, complex sentences, and definition of formality. Right, that's the one where we look at, like, did the student reference a taxonomic group and then add more information for the relative class. Um, and then we'll be using the ANCOVA to determine significance of differences in the post-test means of the treatment and control group, um, taking into account their pre-test um, scores, right? So hopefully, I mean, right, every study is an argument. I'm not sure to what extent the third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade difference is gonna affect the strength of the argument. I, I think the ANCOVA will, um, account for it to some degree, but then one could also make the argument that there's different learning trajectories for third graders versus fourth and fifth graders. So there's some some sticky stuff to be worked out there. Um, and then audio recordings of the recordings of the treatment in progress, um, probably doing some kind of recursive discourse analysis um, to look for themes and patterns in students' progress through the program. Um, so one, if you know, if any of this sounds interesting to you, uh, I might not, unfortunately, be able to continue um, working on it past the end of the semester. So, if you're interested in, in this data, please let me know. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. That's it. Be looking at some results, so I'm really excited, um, curious to know what, what you expect to see from the results of the findings. I mean, the hope, right, is that if um, you know if the hypothesis holds, then that there will be a higher, like um, there'll be less didactic term use in the treatment group, right, or uh, less reliance on didactic terms. That there'll be more tier two vocabulary use. That there'll be uh, more complex sentences. That there'll be greater clarity, greater amount of information communicated, right. So hopefully it'll be all those things. Maybe it'll be some, that seems more likely, right? But they'll improve on some measures and not others. Um, we don't know. I mean, also what I'm kind of interested in is to what extent we can trace um, gradual increase in um, uh, expert positioning across time with the student. So if we can see like the student working with the first grader in the first module versus like fourth module, if we see a difference in how they uh, use language in relation to that first grader. That'd be really interesting. Yeah. How much do you think you'll be able to measure and track, across, I guess, across the, the different classrooms, whether there are any other um, variables that might be affecting these dynamics? So if one classroom, say, has a more uh, democratic teacher and the other one has a more authoritarian one, right? Because that dynamic, or of course, children's home situations, too, of how they, they use discourse and authority at home. Right, so all of those features uh, absolutely affect the, or the, um, the academicness of a student's talk and writing, right? There's no question about that. And I think the whether or not the teacher is more permissive or more egalitarian or more authoritative, I think is a really interesting variable to look at in relation to academic language. I don't think it really has been studied in um, But the the hope with the design of this study is that um, students are you know none of the classes are like the class for students who are from low income homes or from middle income homes, right? So it's sort of there's a random to some degree a random mix. Um, you could argue that like all, maybe sometimes schools have systems where they end up kind of um, collecting very low level or very high level students in one class. 
but we're doing two classes for each, right? So it, it's same thing with the teacher variable, right? So if you have the two treatment and the two control, you could have one teacher that is particularly strong with academic language in the treatment group, um, but you would have the other teacher who's not moving for the meaning across those two. So we're hoping that that will, to some degree, mitigate those issues. But you know, it's like with any small-scale intervention study, there's issues. It's based on one um, uh, that Leister was a um, one of the designers of uh, that was published in Language Learning. So that makes me suspect that like it sort of it, it like again as we think about research always as an argument that has some strengths and some weaknesses. Um, it makes me suspect that it's at least at the level kind of of um, work, previous work in the field around similar issues. And Heather, yeah. Could you talk a little bit more about the content that they'll be teaching? Because mm -hmm. in the picture, it seemed like they're going to be teaching about math, but I was wondering like, if that the different content would have an effect on the different choices that they make in the language. Yeah, that's an interesting question, and it could be something to explore in the transcriptions, um, I mean, sorry, the recordings of the students working on their books and then teaching the student, the first graders, because each unit is a different content topic, right? The, for this study, we didn't dictate specific content, because again, I think a really key piece of doing intervention work is thinking about how can I make this, um, like, enter the context in which I want it to be used in the smoothest, cleanest, easiest way possible, right? And so by allowing teachers to simply do books that um, kind of reviewed content that they had already planned to teach, it like increased sort of the uptake and made it more likely that teachers were going to actually do it. Yeah? Was there any, <clears throat> what was the structure of how the students were asked to make the books? Like, did they have any kind of format? Did they collaborate with each other? Did the teacher help them? That's a good question. Um, so, um, and this is something that will have to be sort of reported as a weakness of the study. Um, in one treatment class, I did the first lesson. In the second treatment class, the teacher did the first lesson. Um, and then after the first lesson, the teachers have been teaching them from now on. Um, Basically, uh, they both included sort of presentation of a big uh, teaching book by the teacher. Right for me, it was um, I said, you know, I have I have friends that are homeschooled and they don't really know how school works, and so I made this book to teach about school. Right. So in the book that I showed, I have like a table of contents and then I have different chapters and a glossary. Right. That teaches all about school. So it was like this very accessible, very um, simple kind of demonstration of a teaching book. And then I asked them, okay, what have you guys been studying? Uh, that, that was fractions, right? I said, what do you know about fractions? They told me some things. I wrote them on the chart paper with their names, right? The point was just to get them excited about the activity. Uh, I said, wow, you know so much about fractions. Um, now you guys are going to write a book about fractions the way I wrote a book about school. You're going to use your books to teach the first graders. So pretty straightforward. And then they decided if they wanted to work alone or in pairs. Um, so again, like, I. I from a, from a research perspective, it would be better if uh, the other teacher and I had said exactly the same thing. From a sort of uh, intervention perspective, um, I think it's, it's good that it's such a straightforward and simple thing that anybody can just sort of pick it up and do. Anything else? Yeah. So um, during the treatment, so the students were practicing being the expert, right, mm -hmm. to the person. Mm -hmm. um, during the assessments, mm -hmm. do you think that their, their relationship with the test giver, the interviewer, would kind of affect? Because in that relationship, the student is not the expert. It mm -hmm. seems that the interviewer is more like, tell me about this. Right. So if, do you think that affected your study? Or? So I don't think it'll affect the results in the sense that it won't affect the difference between the treatment and the control, right? Because the treatment and control are exposed to the same interviewer. I think it's absolutely true. I think something that's part of the kind of lead up to this is um, sociological work that's shown that um, in some families, kids are sort of asked to be the expert or to speak like an expert, even though their their parents know what's being talked about. And in some families, that doesn't happen, right? So kids are going to come expecting to talk as an expert to the adult to different degrees, right? So that's that is some that's an influence on the interaction but I don't think it will 
be different for the treatment of the control. And the hope is that right through the treatment, they come to this new adult being more likely to present themselves as an So they are drawn from previous studies of academic language where people have kind of like looked at talking classrooms or looked at academic texts, right? Um, to say like, what are people doing here that's different than elsewhere? So Schlatter Brown, for example, has done a lot of work on this. Um, uh, studies out of Crest, um, which is in California, mm -hmm. like they do a lot of assessment work, but they also look at like science classroom discourse transcripts, right? And figure out, uh, or science textbooks, things like that what kinds of grammatical choices differentiate academic language from everyday language. Um, and then the other thing is that because I've done previous studies where I looked at some of these features in writing, I didn't take all of the things that other people have noticed when they've analyzed um, talk, academic talk in writing. Right? So for example, um, Robin Scarcella has a pretty comprehensive description of academic language. Um, and she talks about um, modal verbs and passive voice a lot, right? When I analyzed previous, um, you know, fifth grade science writing, I didn't find that there was very much passive voice. It didn't seem to be particularly uh, predictive or useful or interesting. So I didn't include that here. Um, same thing with modal verbs, for example. Um, but I'm very interested in the possibility of other sort of measurable like evidence of the academicness of text and talk. So if you have other ideas, let me know. Do, do you think the variables could be different if this were for adults? Um, yeah, yeah, I mean, I think it would depend on their familiarity with academic language, right? So if they're, if you're working with a much, with students who have been to college, for example, right, then, or if you're, if you're looking at a population that has been to college in a language other than English, I think the variables would be quite different. Like the things that you um, that would differentiate kind of successful from them, successful responses would probably differ. Um, but we have to look at the literature on that. Yeah. Just to piggyback off of Yuna's comment, yeah, I, I tend to think that maybe um, like with higher level, like grade level learners and adults, maybe passives and modals would be more. Significant. I think so. I, again, I think it depends on like if you were working, for example, with um, like a GED population. Um, I think you might find. I mean, we have to we have to do it. <laughs> but I think that sort of familiarity with academic context is so critical mm -hmm. that that piece might be even bigger than the adult child piece. Mm. But be careful, question. <laughs> Anything else? Okay. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you. Thank you.